Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Greg Peterson here, and welcome to the fourth bonus episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where we bring you conversations with experts in fields related to urban farming and dive a little deeper into some of the important issues of our times. Healthy food is something everybody wants. Delicious and nutritious and right outside your own door is even better. Just text GARDEN to 44222 or visit IWANTTOGARDEN.COM and you will receive our free webinar about the seven key factors you need to know to grow your own food. Today in this bonus podcast, we have my recent conversation with Jake Mace as together we address the questions sent to us by you, our gardening and fruit tree enthusiasts. For future episodes, if you want to send a question for us to answer, send it to questions at urbanfarm.org. And to sign up for the live webinar of this project, go to askjakeandgreg.com. Hey, hey, everybody. It is Greg Peterson coming to you from the Urban Farm. And tonight I am here for our Ask Jake and Greg's segment of what we do. Jake and I do this every month. Welcome, Jake. Hey, everybody. How's it going? How's it going, Greg? Hey, it is going great. And I, you know, I love doing these. So thank you, everybody that's out there for showing up and listening to what we have to share and sending your questions over. So, Mr. Mace, first of all, what are you doing in your garden these days? Let's start there. Well, for folks who follow me on my Instagram, which is Jake mm -hmm. Mace Tai Chi, if you follow my Jake Mace Tai Chi Instagram, mm -hmm. there's two parts to Instagram. One is the main post and then the story. And the stories delete every 24 hours. So I usually post what oh, I'm doing in my nice. garden in the story. Uh huh. Yes. Yeah, so normally, if you're in the main post, you'll see like martial arts or fitness stuff. But if you go to the top of the story, I always show, you know, live of what I'm doing in the garden every 24 hours. Wow. And today, I was pretty much. I'm recovering from a sunburn I just got in San Francisco, and I was in my garden, and I was cutting aloe vera off my aloe vera plants, Oh! and I was smearing aloe vera gel from my garden over my entire body. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, Why is that? I always have had a, a dream to go to San Francisco. I've been going there since I was 20. Oh, wow. Uh -huh. and, um, I used to do a lot of seminars there and have a lot of friends there, so I I've always wanted to go to San Francisco and instead of being the electric car driving kind of normal hippie gardening vegan guy, uh -huh. I wanted to rent a convertible and drive around ah. San Francisco and over the Golden Gate Bridge in the convertible. So I did that, but I got a lot of sunburn. So it was a great trip. I had a lot of fun, but it got a little bit of sunburn as a result. All right. What kind of convertible? I don't know. It was just like some kind of a, uh, a Camaro. <laughs> oh, <laughs> some kind of a, a Camaro, dude. That's <laughs> nice. epic. That's cool. It was that a pretty good trip. Cool. It was an amazing trip. Yeah, a lot of fun. Yeah. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So back to your garden. What are you? So besides the aloe vera, what else are you doing? Yeah, so I did aloe vera today. Also, I have tons of ripe figs right now. Uh, it's oh, right. you have to understand that this is July in Phoenix, so the worst my garden. There's two months out of the year where my garden looks the worst. The coldest month of the winter, which usually is like February, January, yeah. and that's when everything's dormant and sleeping. But then right. June, like the second half of June, the first half of July, it also looks the worst. Yeah. But what people don't realize is when the winter comes around, the garden is sleeping. Everything's actually storing up energy to release all that flowers and fruit and produce in the springtime. Mm -hmm. And in the heat of the summer, all my raised beds pretty much kind of, kind of kind of fizzle out and die out but yeah. I leave all the dead plants there and I keep watering about once a day because they drop seeds they all went to seed they drop their seeds oh yes and the dead plants kind of create a mulch layer on top for my soil so when mm -hmm. I plant this week I'll be planting this weekend my whole fall garden this weekend yeah and my soil will be amazing and I'll have probably 50 to 60 percent of my garden will sprout up for free because those seeds that dropped in June will germinate and grow into my fall crops. Woohoo! Love that. So in addition to that, I have the fresh figs, the aloe vera. I also have tons of jujubes right now, J-U-J-U-B-E. Oh, really? And, yeah, and they're a fruit that grows on a tree. 
-huh. and you can eat green like a crunchy apple or I let them dehydrate down into a red shriveled up uh, date looking fruit that's much more yeah. sweet and delicious. Yeah. I also have papayas. I've had, I've, been, I've had papayas every single day in my garden since March. Wow. I've eaten over probably 60, 70 papayas this year. Whoa, off my three dude, papayas. really? Yeah, no, no wow. joke. I'm like seriously eating a papaya every day for the last many months. Wow. You know, that, that's a cool thing about what's going on in Phoenix right now. It's, it's warmer in the winter, so our papayas don't die back mm -hmm. or die at all, at all. And I've got mm, softball-sized papayas. Obviously, that's they're football-shaped. But they're, so they're not close to being ripe yet, but I've got them coming as well. Cool. You know, keep it up. I mean, they're fantastic. And one of the best fruits to eat for your, for your gut uh, biome and your digestion is papaya. Yeah, right. Also, I just started two days ago eating my guavas. So we're at the very beginning of guava Ooh, season now. Ooh, nice. And actually, I have a tree that's the most fruitful in my yard right now that dropped. I ate five papayas five guavas off of it this morning and uh -huh. one of them was the size of a baseball it was actually when I got from your fruit tree program where you do Woo here at um, urbanfruittrees.org. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, I, and I have a, a papaya in my backyard right now that's got golf ball size. They're hard yet, but they've got golf ball size fruit on it. So they're coming. That's awesome. My, my pink guava and a couple other of the varieties, haven't yet gotten ripe yet, but the one I got from your fruit tree program is looking really good. And it's um, got the ripe ones looking their, their taste. I mean, I had never tried a guava before I grew it myself in my yard, as is the case with most of the fruit that I grow in my yard. Yeah, there you go. Once you grow it, you, you get to eat it for the first time. And I just love guavas now so much. I love them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, cool. And, and I just want to shout out to everybody. This is a reason we experiment a lot with this stuff. You know, you just got to, jump in and experiment and don't be afraid to fail. That's, in fact, that's the reason I asked that question on my podcast of everybody. When I interview them, I say, what's, you know, talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that failure and what you might've learned from it. Because a lot of people are so incredibly afraid to fail in gardening. And it's like, Hey, I I'm, so I'm telling one on me right now, my tomatoes this year basically were a flop. Hmm. Uh, you know, I, I did everything I was supposed to, and we got the tomatoes in a little bit late, first week of March. Uh, but one of the things that happened this year, and, uh, you know, beyond my control, but in May, it got down into the, you know, 60s and, you know, lower 70s at night for a few nights. And that really slowed everything down. You know, that really highly impacted our tomato harvest. Yeah. You know, so we, we have to... Just know that you're going to have some failures and you're going to have some successes. And this is how we learn. I totally so, agree. And if you can even get the tomatoes to fruit a little bit, it will give you motivation for the next season. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Plus, everybody so, out there who's got a new garden growing, if your garden's new, it's always the most difficult to get your garden to work when it's new because of two things. Yeah. One, you're a beginner. Right. And number two, your soil hasn't yet become a living yep. organism yet. It's still just a brand new soil. Yeah, your soil is a beginner. It's a beginner. So it, once yeah. you're, I've, I've found that once you're four years in, your soil, as long as you've kept it going yeah. for four years and you've been layering your compost, your worm castings, your rock dust powder, and your coconut core, which mm -hmm. I call Mace's Mix, if you want to go to jakemace.com and check it out, we, um, we find that after year four, it actually becomes so alive that gardening becomes really simple. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I'm, I'm actually having a, a plethora of stuff grow in my garden right now. Uh, they're called weeds. Okay. You know, with, with our rain that we've gotten over the past couple of weeks, the weeds have just exploded and um, you know, it kind of got out of, it, it got, got out of hand. So I spent me and a, a, a friend of mine spent about four hours digging out weeds out of the front yard today. So, you know, if you guys, if you guys saw a picture of my front yard right now, I would be cringing because of the, you know, the challenge that we've had with the weeds. So, you know, so there, there's goods and goods and bads with this and we just have to take a deep breath and harvest what you can and learn where you can and move forward.
Yeah, and in fact, I want to. I just want to throw this out to everybody. If you go to GrowingFoodTheBasics.com, that is our seven-week online course uh, that you can check out uh, that Kari Spencer and I teach on, you know, the basics of gardening. So if you're new to gardening, you can check out that. There's a free webinar that comes with it, and uh, you know, yeah, go there, do that, and that'll that'll give you some uh, a pathway to get started with your garden. So we have a bunch of questions here today, and not surprising, Jake. Tom from Loma Linda, California, welcome Tom, says, while peaches are now ripening on the tree, should the watering be more, less, or the same? Watering deeply once a week, is there a general rule of thumb regarding watering fruit trees? You want to take a stab at that, Mr. Jake? Sure. Did you say where he was from? Loma Linda, California. I believe it's it's a it's a warmer low desert ish space. So, you know that's amazing that he's getting peaches still right now because I'm way past at that time. You know, like yeah, usually uh, April May in the Phoenix area is peach time. April May June exactly. Yeah. So the thing Loma Linda California, although it's you know it's warmer, it's probably not up into the 105 to 115 like we get here. So it's over there. It's actually not surprising that they're getting peaches now. So watering. Watering is not a science. So there's a couple of things that I believe when it comes to watering, uh -huh. whether the tree is fruiting or not, I think watering is more of an art actually. Uh -huh. <laughs> and the more, right. and more I garden, the more, and more I realize that yep. you, you cannot just give one uh, watering advice for all gardeners. Yeah. So it will depend. What's his name? Tom, Greg? Um, yes, good memory. But... It, it's going to depend whether Tom has a lot of mulch on the ground. If Tom has a lot of mulch, yep. if he has a lot of leaves and wood chips on his ground around the tree, and not just right around the trunk, but I'm talking like 10, 20 feet out around the tree, yeah. like make your Bigger backyard a bunch of mulch. Yeah. Yeah. And if he has a, you know, a foot or two feet of mulch, maybe even three feet of mulch, especially being in the Southwest, like he is where it's drier, he'll have to water less because that mulch will keep the moisture in the soil. Right. If he has no mulch, then he's going to have to water more because his ground's going to dry out much faster, which, yeah, is faster. Going to cause, which is going to cause him to water more and leach the soil of more nutrients. So I really believe in mulch as a way to give the tree healthy fertilizer year round as that mulch breaks down. Mm -hmm. It conserves water and it also stops the gardener, meaning us, the, the human, from watering too much and flushing nutrients away from the tree. But yeah, exactly. For, for me, when my peach trees, when they go dormant in the wintertime, I do stop watering them once they're dormant in the wintertime. Yeah. Once the leaves fall off. But in the summertime, when they're fruiting or when they're leaving out, I would say I might water my peaches like, you know, three times a week in the, when it's over 110 degrees. But if it's mm. under 110, like twice a week. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my gut reaction on that would be that would be too much water. And one really big solution is about an $8 product you can buy at most nurseries. It's a water meter. So I, I highly suggest, it's a moisture meter, sorry, uh, that you go buy a moisture meter and use that, Tom, to you know test the soil to make sure that, you know, does it, does it really need water? And then pay attention to the tree as well, because the tree will tell you if it's drooping a little bit that it needs water. However, the caveat here is that overwater, an overwatered tree droops as well. So you have to make sure that you don't overwater the tree. Yeah, going, going and getting that moisture meter for eight bucks, uh, that's a miracle waiting to happen as far as I'm concerned. Vicki Massey in Mesa says, just bought a sapote, suggested planting place. Well, we'd really need to see, Vicki, we'd need to see a picture of your yard to suggest that. I would... Uh, you know, give it some afternoon shade, lots of mulch around it, like we were just talking about. And uh, yeah, like that. And, and here's the thing that I would say about that is you're, you're in Mesa, Arizona, which is right next to Phoenix. Mm -hmm. And since I'm going to guess that the majority of the people out there listening are urban gardeners, they're in, you know, an urban city. They're not like out on a farm on yep. 160 acres of land or more, you know? So if you're in an urban setting, you probably have a wall or a house on your property. Yep. And I have seen in the Phoenix area that sapote seem to do very well if they're planted right next to a wall or a house. Oh, why is that? I think that the wall and the house create a microclimate for the tree 
and actually serve as a parent, like a, a father or a mother for, for the mm -hmm. tree. So if you plant your sapote on the eastern side of your wall or house so that it gets the morning sun, but once the sun gets high in the sky, the wall or the house helps to shade it and let the tree grow over the house or over the wall as it gets more mature and strong. Yeah. So I've done that with a Vernon sapote, which is a white sapote and a red lemon yeah. sapote I have right now in my yard. Mm -hmm. And the, the white sapote is, in its third year on the ground right now, it's probably about 12 feet tall and it's got about 20 or 30 sapote on there, all baseball size right now. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Oh my God, you got sapotes. Yeah, it's my first crop of sapote. Nice. So we're going to see how they do and when they ripen, probably be like in a, a month or so. Nice. The first couple of years I had that sapote in the ground, the wall really, really shaded it from 11 in the morning on and the wall also blocked all the wind from hitting it so i was oh, nervous yeah. that the tree was getting too much shade but you know what happened was the tree just kept growing taller i kept pruning it because it kept trying to lean yeah. i would stake it up and now it's above the wall it's growing a great shape and it can handle the full sun because it's mature cool so greg and i were just talking about the importance of a microclimate uh, yeah. with your garden and your fruit trees and if you're in an urban setting, use a wall or a house as a microclimate producer, especially yeah. if you can put the wall or the house on the western side so the tree is on the eastern side. Yeah. Cool. So next question, Gail says, as the wood chips break down, do they affect the pH of the soil? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a stab at that, and then I'll let you jump in on it. Yeah, well, I'm going to say it's probably going to normalize the pH. But then also it depends on what, you know, what the pH of the wood chips are. So that's, that's one of those wild card questions, I think. Don't you, Jake? Yeah, and I am not the best gardening scientist. I'm more of a gardening artist that kind of goes with the flow. So yeah. I've never tested the pH of my soil, not even once. But I use a lot of wood chips, and I use more yep. wood chips per capita than any other gardener I've seen. I'm, I'm only not a scientist. <laughs> yeah, there's yeah. an understatement. So it definitely will change the pH of your soil, but I think like Greg said, it will change it for the better and normalize yeah. it to a level that's healthy for your fruit trees and permaculture designed urban yeah. food forest, backyard and front yard. Amen to that. So Alexander says, what planting calendar do you use to determine when different vegetable crops should be put in the ground? Well, that really depends where you live, Alexander. For Phoenix, if you go to plantingcalendar.org, you can, you know, get one for the Phoenix area. Jake, what about you? Yeah, I would say um, yours, Greg, the urbanfarm.org one is uh, yeah. a good one. Plantingcalendar.org. Yeah, definitely find a planting calendar that's local for your city. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, you got to do that. And often they're put out by the uh, cooperative extension in the area. Exactly. So just, you know, follow up with the cooperative extension. Which is so, usually run by the university that sits in your town, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So Carlos wants to know, Jake, when are you having your next garden tour? The second part of this, Greg, do you have scheduled tours? So I'll address that in a minute. But you got any scheduled tours at this point or are we waiting until the fall? Yeah, no. The last couple of tours that I've had, I've had folks come in from Utah and Colorado and Tucson wow. and California. They've been coming from all over the country. Mm -hmm. And I don't think my yard's worth that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's just a one third of an acre yard in a very humble neighborhood in Tempe. But yeah. I think people like it because it is in an urban setting. They like yeah. it. Yeah. And they have seen it in my YouTube show, which is called the vegan athlete. So if they go on YouTube and follow my garden from beginning to end on Vegan Athlete. They, they want to go see it in person. And it's for the gardeners who are very skillful and master gardeners, it's kind of maybe like inspiring. Mm -hmm. But for the gardeners who are beginners, which is 80% of the people that come to my tour, it is a class that will allow you to leave with two years worth of knowledge right away. And you'll wow. save a lot of money and Amen great to that. for the experience and the beginner. So I just was going to schedule one today for about a month from now. So if the right. best way to find out, I'm thinking I'm going to have one the end of August, August 20 okay. something. All right. And if you go to my Urban Gardening in Arizona Facebook group, it's called Urban Gardening in Arizona, join the Facebook group and I'll post an event in there when it's scheduled. Perfect. Perfect. It's in, in what y'all have to know, if you're not from here, don't come to Phoenix in August. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's pretty brutal. I'm actually surprised you're giving one. I'm not giving one at the urban, at the urban farm. I think until into October. Just because you know, I usually tell people I do it at eight o'clock in the morning, and uh, we go for two hours. I tell them mm -hmm. that we have refreshments out. I tell them to bring sunglasses and notes, and you can kind of see my garden in the hottest, most dismal part of the summer, and kind of get some go. tips how to protect your plants when it's really hot. Cool. I just had my friends cool. out to Phoenix from Florida. Uh, they run this company called uh, Miami Fruit. Oh, they were out? Yeah, they stayed with me for the night. And they run a great company where you can order tropical fruit from them that they pick themselves and they'll ship it to you wherever state or city you, you, you live in. If you go to MiamiFruit.org and tell them that the vegan athlete sent you, Jake Mace. But they were out and they told me that they're starting to be able to grow things in Florida like durian fruit and soursop because of global warming. They couldn't, they said even 10 years ago, it got too cold in Florida to grow some of these super uh -huh. tropicals like jackfruit, yep. and durian, and soursop. Yep. Yep. And now in Florida, they're having an easy time growing it because it just doesn't get that cold anymore because of climate change. Right. Climate change is a better term for it because things are changing. Mm -hmm. You know, some, some people are getting warmer, some people are getting colder. We're getting warmer here. The last two years here in Phoenix, we haven't had a hard freeze in the wintertime. You know, right. So I'm I'm actually telling people to get started with, uh, you know, their tomatoes in December. Sure. You know, get your get your tomatoes started early. So I need to get the Miami fruit people on the podcast. Will you uh, introduce them to me? Yeah, they're a really cool couple. They're young and very knowledgeable and very you know enthusiastic about gardening yeah. and growing their own fruit and all that stuff. Cool. And they're both vegan too. Oh, very good. Perfect. And Rain, he's the guy, his name is Rain. He just did a full marathon, or not a full marathon, a full triathlon. Oh, my God. A full That's triathlon. worse than a marathon. He did, the, he did a um, 120 miles on the bike, two point, what is it, 2.2 mile swim, and then a 26 yep. mile marathon back to back yep. to back. Wow. And, and Adele, who's the other half, um, she, just did a, she just did the San Francisco marathon. So they're both fueling themselves with plants and they're pretty athletic and pretty strong. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. All right. Ethan from Chandler says, I've got a lot of questions. I'm fairly new to this and would love to get some trees in the ground ASAP. Well, Ethan, don't. You really should wait till January to plant. We'll talk more about that here in a minute. He wants moringa, fig, loquat, and some other stone fruits would be awesome. If the soil is terrible, where I am, can I start by using the mace mix in the hole for the tree, then enrich the surrounding soil as the months pass, or do I spend a year letting my lot sheet mulch and plant trees next year? So where do you want to start with this, Mr. Mace? Yeah, I think that if you are getting a plan together of where you're going to plant your fruit trees in your property, mm -hmm. and you're not ready to plant right now, you can dig the holes right now and fill it with the, the orchard mix called Mace's Mix that I recommend on my website, jakemace.com. Mm -hmm. Yep. And fill the hole with the mix, but don't plant the tree yet and just water it, you know, once a week as if there's a tree there. And then when you finally plant the tree, it will be a living hole that will be ready to accept yeah. the seed. All the microbes in that hole will be alive and the tree will have no shock. Yeah. So what, what he's saying when he says he has crappy soil is that in the Phoenix area, if he's in Chandler, he probably has either clay <laughs> soil or very rocky soil, one or the yeah. other. Yeah. And so it's either, if it's, if it's clay soil, it can basically suffocate the roots of a fruit tree unless mm -hmm. you amend it, which means add compost, add mycorrhiza, add composted mulch, which is very important, that word composted mulch, not just fresh yeah. mulch, but composted mulch. Add lava sand, add worm castings, and add all that to the native soil and then put tons of mulch on top. And when yeah. you do that, you will, I think, you know, Greg, I think here's the thing. I've got over 200 fruit trees on my third of an acre. So it's pretty packed with fruit trees. Mm -hmm. So I have dug so many holes in my <laughs> backyard, in my front yard. Yeah. That I feel like I've probably dug out 50% of the clay in my backyard, one hole at a time. Yeah. So now what's happening is as the roots of the tree grow out, it attracts all the worms, the roly polies, cockroaches, all kinds of, it attracts, I have so many millipedes and centipedes in my yard right now. It's insane. And millipedes oh, nice. put off their own brand of, of millipede yep. castings, just like worm yeah. castings. And so what happens is that those bugs, 
will climb out of the hole and aerate the clay around it. So I feel like my backyard has become a spongy, loomy kind of forest climate right. now. Yeah. This is uh, six years into my project. Yeah. So, and you know, Ethan, here's the other thing. So I highly suggest that you plant fruit trees in January, February, March only. Uh, mostly, especially for the citrus and the stone fruit, for sure, because that's when they are shipped from the growers and they arrive to us. And that, and now I'm talking for Phoenix here, everybody. If you're outside of Phoenix, then sorry, but this is for Phoenix. That way they have enough time to get established before it gets too hot. And then they have a lot of time to establish before it freezes. So the way our fruit tree program, and you're given you're in Chandler, uh, you know, you really need to come to our fruit tree program launch event that we're having on doing on September 2nd. In fact, Jake Mace is one of the speakers, and we're going to talk all about growing fruit trees and how to be successful with them here. Uh, and I love what you shared, uh, Jake, about the, you know, mace mix in the holes. That's brilliant. I just stumbled across that a couple of years ago where, well, let's pre-dig our holes and put healthy soil in it and let it start curing. Exactly. And just go on YouTube and type in, in the YouTube search box, type in Jake Mace, how to plant a fruit tree. Mm -hmm. And you'll find you about 10 videos of mine that I show, I show a good video of how to do it. Yeah. Ethan also says, what should I be doing in my garden right now? What uh, I would do for him is I would, what I would do is I would take my advice and plant the largest trees and I call them fruit trees, but any edible tree that's the largest tree that produces the most amount of shade, mm -hmm. plant those first right now. Or whenever, well, Greg says, or whenever Greg says to plant them, because then yeah, not right now. you will get them growing as parents and they will yeah. create a micro, microclimate for the other ones. Because I was dumb and I planted like a fig tree first, a peach tree first, a lemon tree first. And those are not big canopy trees. I should have planted moringa trees, pecan trees. I should have planted mesquite trees and ironwood mm -hmm. trees. And I should have planted shoestring acacias and palo verdes. I should have planted a carob tree, a female fruiting carob, and female fruiting mulberry trees first. Yeah. So if you guys, that list I just read right there, it's very important. Plant those trees first and let them start to grow. And then all your other delicious trees, like your papayas or your avocados or your peaches, peaches stone fruits, apricots, yeah. plant them a year later once those aforementioned ones have grown up big and become the parents especially so this is for desert dwellers especially if you have what's called a really hot microclimate if you've got a lot of gravel a lot of block walls you need to get it shaded and i was going to say if you're going to plant the you know the shade trees in your yard those those, those can go in in october september october once it starts cooling down so but what Ethan what Ethan's question was was what do I start doing in his garden right now? So what I would do in your garden right now is prepare your garden beds for fall vegetables and you can start planting fall vegetables off of our planting calendar plantingcalendar.org. You can start planting them mid September, early to mid September. I've actually planted the hardier ones, arugula, kale, and some of the brassicas, so broccoli, cauliflower, that kind of stuff, as early as August 2nd from seed, from seed. So you can do that. It's, you know, it's a, it's, it's a bit of an experiment. Just know it's a bit of an experiment. But prepping your soil in your gardens right now, getting your gardens ready, adding mace mix to your garden beds, you know, making sure that you have good, healthy soil in your garden beds, not dirt. You don't want to use the dirt in your yard. So let's just review real quickly, Jake. And well, the number one, the number one most important thing to do right now is add mulch. Nope, number one, number one, even before mulch. Oh, it, tell me. You've got to go to seedbankbox.com uh, uh, and sign up for my seed program because we're sending out monthly appropriate, seasonally appropriate seed bank boxes full of uh, seeds you can plant right now. So if you guys order from seed bank box in the next four days you'll get uh -huh. august seed bank box which is coming out in four days from now which is going to be august appropriate seeds to plant in your garden right now nice there excellent there's, my, there's my my plug for the company that not only am i involved with but i also plant the seeds of and i think it's great yeah exactly and it's only 20 bucks so just try it out there you go good job Woohoo! i'm just going to read this one it's from jennifer 
I really like Jake's videos about what he eats in a day. Everything he eats looks so perfect, even if he picks it right off the plant. What is Jake using to keep the pests from eating holes in the leaves and fruits and vegetables? They always uh, eat the, the leaves. <laughs> great question. Well, that's not actually not quite true. There's a whole lot of, Jennifer, there's a whole lot of science that goes behind this question or the answer to this question. And the single biggest thing that you can do to create healthy plants, I'm going to quiz you, Jake. What is it? Is build the soil. Is build healthy soil. If you can build healthy soil, you're going to have healthier plants that are less susceptible to bugs. I don't have, generally speaking, I don't have a bug problem here at the urban farm. What about you, Jake? It gets less and less every year that I garden yeah. because right. my, it, as my soil gets better and better, and as my trees create a better microclimate for the garden, my pest bugs get lower and lower, but I find more bugs like praying mantids and, and yeah. bugs like, like bees and things like that. Right. Yeah. So build healthy soil is absolutely number one. I want to review for everybody. I started this moment ago. I want to re review for everybody. What is healthy soil? And I'm going to do, here's what I'm going to do, Jake. I'm going to talk about what really is the first step to building healthy soil in your garden. And then I'm going to, I'm going to have you chime in with your mace mix and how it works. Okay. You know, just one more thing before you do that, Greg, is I want everybody to think about out there. When you go to the store to buy perfect kale or perfect lettuce that has nothing, that no part of it is eaten by a bug, mm -hmm. why do you want to eat that? You got to wonder. Isn't, isn't, aren't the bugs going to eat the most edible part of the plant? And wouldn't you want to eat the same plant that a bug wanted to eat? So yeah. I'm actually okay eating lettuce and cabbages and yeah. kale that have been eaten by bugs because yeah. I, just, I just brush the bugs off and eat the rest of the plant. Yeah. Figuring yeah, that if it's good enough for a bug, it's good enough for the vegan athlete. Woo! <laughs> I love it. Well, plus, you know, you got to wonder how much chemicals they put on perfect fruit. That's what I'm saying. And perfect, exactly. And perfect veggies. You, know, you got to wonder, exactly. you know, what's what's going on with that. So, healthy soil. There are five components of healthy soil in my book, and your mace mix fits in perfectly to these five healthy healthy soil components. So, the first component of healthy soil. Uh, is what everybody has out there, which is dirt. It's highly compacted. It's dense. The water can't get into it. It's got a lot of micronutrients, you know, locked into it. But if you try planting in straight dirt, and I can't tell you, Jake, how many emails I get from people and, and uh, you know, communications I get from people, and they go out in their backyard and they dig a hole and they plant a garden. Right. And it's like, well, what did you add to the dirt? Uh, because dirt's the number one component. The second component is organic matter, and lots of it, compost, and you know, just and just more stuff you're going to talk about here in a minute. So lots of great compost. So dirt, organic matter, airspace, so that the roots roots can breathe, water, and everything that's alive in the soil. That's what makes healthy soil. Now your perfect solution, Ethan to starting to get that healthy soil is add lots of organic matter. You can use straight up compost. The problem with com straight up compost is that it's, it gets pretty dense. So if you put two inches of straight compost on top of your garden, it compacts pretty quickly. And that's one of the reasons that I like premium potting soil. Uh, it's, a, it's a potting soil mix that you can buy by the bag or by the truckload. It's, it's a little more fluffy than just straight up compost. Um, so that's, that's really step number one for your lesson in getting, you know, great, healthy soil. And step number two is to, uh, you know, take Jake's advice um, and you can get mace mix on his website. You can get mace mix during our fruit tree program when we fire it up in the, you know, in January and February. But what is mace mix, Jake, and how does it work? Because it's, this is, I, I tell, in fact, let me tell a quick story on you. I, I know I interrupted you again, but sorry. When I was at your garden here three years ago, I saw it at the beginnings. And I, you know, about every six months I get to visit your garden. One of the things that I noticed this last time that I was in your garden is that your garden is the most thriving, energetic, green, spectacular garden I've seen here in town. Oh, thanks, and, Greg. Yeah, absolutely. And what I know about that is that what does it 
is your mace mix. So tell everybody about what that is. It's nothing special. It's just it's just from the earth. You know, it's just earthly stuff. If you go to jigmace.com, I have two cards you can buy, and they come like waterproof, high quality, so you can take them out in your garden. And one is for maces mixed for trees, and one is maces mixed for for gardens. Mm -hmm. So go to jigmace.com and buy the card. But I'll tell you guys what it is right now. But the card tells you the proportions and everything in detail. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to plant a raised bed garden or even an in-ground garden, what I do is the bottom half of the garden, let's say you put your raised bed on the ground or you dig out the spot in the ground to amend for your in-ground garden, okay? Mm -hmm. The bottom half is straight compost. So whatever the bottom 50% of your garden is, I just put 100% compost that, here's the, here's the caveat, it's gotta be locally made compost. Mm, right. So if you're in Phoenix, you've got, like Greg said, you got to go to a locally made place and get locally made compost. Don't go, don't go to the big box stores and buy a bag compost unless that bag compost was made in your city. And usually it says that on the tag. It does, which means that usually 95% of the soils in the big box stores is out. You know, it's not able to be purchased by you because it's going to be dust. And it took a lot of shipping to get it to that store. And you're just, yeah. uh, you're going to be buying ten dollars or twenty dollars for dust because it's going to be dead soil yeah when you get a compost that's locally made it's still teeming with microbes and it's alive so do yourself a favor and the bottom 50 percent of your garden make it 100 percent compost so if you're you're talking about a, even either a raised bed mm -hmm. or if you're digging your garden down put you know if you, if you dig your garden down a little bit put six inches of compost on the bottom and then what do you put on the top six inches so the top 50%, the top half needs to be a combination of compost, worm castings, coconut core, and rock dust powder. Mm -hmm. And the rock dust powder is usually a brand called Azamite, or you can get a brand called uh, Gaia Green uh, Glacial Rock Dust. If you go, again, if you go to jakemace.com and click on the gardening store, we can give you a $10 bag of rock dust that you can try out in your garden that you can use yeah. for at least a two or three raised beds. And all it is, is a rock dust is a ground up, is, is a bunch of ground up rocks into a powder. Mm -hmm. So it's just rocks, just minerals. It's like they took basically a bunch of boulders and ground them up into a powder. Yep. But the reason why it's appropriate, like let's say the Azamite, which is A to Z of minerals, including trace elements. It's a company called Azamite that sells rock dust. But azomite's rock dust actually has over like uh, 70 different different minerals in it and trace elements. So it's got a broad spectrum of minerals. Instead of just taking one rock and crushing up that one type of rock, they're mm -hmm. crushing up dozens and dozens of types of rocks. So you get a broad spectrum of minerals in your in your rock dust. Yeah, and that's important because all of your bugs and microbes and bacteria they eat that rock dust and turn it into energy and into healthy soil for your plants, and your plants absorb all those minerals. So if you eat a, a sweet pepper or a tomato out of my garden, it's infinitely more nutritious and full of minerals than the one you buy organically yeah. at Whole Foods. Whole Foods can't even dream of growing food as healthy <laughs> as you guys can because even Donald Trump, I don't care how rich Donald Trump says he is or how powerful he thinks he is, mm -hmm. there's no chance, zero chance, that Donald Trump is eating as healthy of a diet as me because right. he's not growing a garden. Yeah. And so the power of the gardening community is that no matter how poor or rich you are, if you pump rock dust and worm castings and compost and coconut core into the top half of your raised bed garden or your in-ground garden, that's going to make food for your family that's more nutritious than the store or that the billionaires can ever buy. Yeah. So that's the mix, those four things on the top half. And then on the very, very top, like the top one inch, I do a straight layer of coconut core and I plant my seeds in that one inch of oh, coconut core because nice. that stays really wet. But coconut core basically has no nutrition for your plant. So it's just there to stay wet as like a spongy Sponge. yeah. growing medium. And as the seed grows into a plant, the roots will go through that coconut core into the nutritious soil that's down below. Mm -hmm. And your plant will be really happy and you'll have healthy, happy plants that are hopefully more disease resistant and bug resistant and 
more uh, mineral rich for your family. So that was a long winded yeah. answer, but I hope you guys got that. No, yeah, no, no, that was really good. That's really what I want. And, you know, you can get it from Jake. You can also get it elsewhere. And, uh, you know, that's, that's always a great way to go. So why don't you add mycorrhiza to your gardens? I've always been curious about that. Because the compost is locally made and worm castings, those two things have so much mycorrhizum and mycelium in it that you can literally just, it's just kind of a waste to put expensive mycorrhiza from a bag mm. in your raised bed garden because it's going to find its way in there so easily. I put the mycorrhiza in my, the fruit holes tree. in my fruit trees because yeah. I'm digging those holes directly in the clay and I want to bring life to all the surrounding soil around that hole. So as the tree's roots grow out, they have this, you know, a beneficial bacteria called mycelium that can create a web in your earth where your trees in your front yard can communicate and uh, share nutrients with your trees in your backyard and vice versa. Yeah. So let, I, I think that if, if I did, most of my, my gardens are in raised beds, Greg, but if I did an in-ground garden, like Greg has an in-ground garden in his front yard, I, when I'm first setting up the in-ground garden, I think I would, I would spread some mycorrhiza on the bottom there, just to jumpstart it. Yeah. If it was in the ground, sure. Yeah. And you guys can get, again, I, I don't mean to plug my site, but you guys can get a, the same bag of mycorrhiza that I use. Uh, you can get it from jakemace.com for like, I think it's like seven bucks or something. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. All right. So Amanda doesn't say where Amanda is at. Amanda says, my backyard is filled with caliche and compacted soil. I'll bet, given that she's in the Phoenix area, that seems like it goes down forever and is backbreaking to dig in. Is it really necessary to dig down several free feet through the bad layer for planting trees or in ground vegetable beds? Or is it possible for the microbial life and microscopic decomposers like earthworms, et cetera, to naturally loosen the soil and break up the caliche? Um, so Amanda, our big solution is add lots of wood chips. And really the, the quick answer is if you put six to eight inches of wood chips on caliche, yes, over the next course of the next two or three years, it starts breaking down and you get this amazing soil that happens at the interface between the wood chips and the dirt that's there. That's your, that was your experience, yes, Jake? Yeah, I think that she kind of answered her own question. She's yeah. on the right track, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And she wants to know what your favorite mul mulberry cultivar is. Uh, Pakistani. Pak the Pakistani one. You know, but the, the, oh, so the Pakistani fruit is like a three-inch fruit. It ripens in March and April, which is really nice. I have a second favorite one, Jake, and that is the dwarf mulberry bush. Oh, that, that's my second favorite, too. I love that yeah. one second. Yep. I, I always say that the Pakistan number one, the dwarf ever-bearing uh, bush number two. But Mulberry, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. Amanda also wants to know, she said, I recently lost a Santa Rosa plum to desert root rot. Are there any edible fruit trees immune to this disease? I don't know the answer to that question. I was just trying to do a, an internet search just a moment ago to see if I could come up with it. I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't, I couldn't do it that quickly. Sorry. Uh, so I checked Google on that. Um, yeah. So I, I, um, I researched this a bunch about a year ago. Yeah. So I think Texas root rot is also called cotton rot. I think they're the same thing. Yeah. And I lost, I'm losing stone fruit trees to the root rot. And um, a lot of people in town say that there's, there, there's no cure to it, including my friend Doug Jones, who runs the Arizona Rare Fruit Growers. He's been in contact with a university horticulturist, and he says yep. there's really no, no cure for it. So what I found is that every time I, I've lost a stone fruit tree to the root rot, which actually starves the tree of water, it kind of makes mm -hmm. it look like it dries out really quick. Yeah. From my research, I have found, and this is my research I've done, is that if you plant a, like a date palm or a pomegranate or a citrus or a fig, they are, or like a jujube, they yeah. are less likely affected by the root rot where stone fruit is the most affected. Yeah. So I would, I've been, any tree, like I had a plum and a pluot die of the root rot, which I think was root rot. Yeah. There's really, there's really nowhere to tell if it's root rot unless you get the soil tested, but I'm pretty sure it was root rot. Yeah. Well, and one so way I to just, tell, one way to tell is if you literally, a tree looks perfectly okay. And then all of a sudden the next day it's dead, literally 24 hours later, it like shrivels up and dies. Exactly. And then you walk over to the tree and you, you can literally just push it over. Yeah. Yeah. That's a sure indicator. 
So I wouldn't plant another stone fruit in that hole. And what I was going to say also, Jake, is that adding the life to the soil, if, if she were to dig out a big area around that and put compost and mycorrhiza and earthworms and, you know, really get the soil going, I think that you could probably be really successful at growing a, another one there. In fact, we should, we should do that experiment. I'll give you some trees this, this spring, Jake, and let's pick a place where one of them died. Let's dig out the hole. We can put this on video. We'll film this. We'll dig out the hole and add your stuff in it, add the premium potting soil, you know, add some really good stuff and then plant a tree in there and see how it does. Cool. I just would say folks living in the Southwest United States, put a date palm there, man. Date palm is not oh, going to yeah. die from root rot and date palms are the number one fruit tree you should be growing in your yard. My yeah. first ever date palm came from Greg's fruit tree program. Woo! Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just give us a rundown. I know you, you mentioned seed bank box. You mentioned jakemace.com. You know, you can get a lot of these things from Jake at, at jakemace.com, right? Exactly. So if you want to join my seed program, which is a great program for 20 bucks a month, you can keep going month to month or cancel anytime. Mm -hmm. It's at seedbankbox.com. Seedbankbox.com. Perfect. There's also Perfect. a link to it at jakemace.com. But if you go to jakemace.com, M-A-C-E, you can get to my gardening store where you can get all the same gardening products, fertilizers, foliar feeds, and help that I use in my garden. I put mm -hmm. on my store and they're pretty inexpensive. And we ship them to you right away. So check it out at jakemace.com. And if you guys want to see my most recent YouTube videos, just go to Vegan Athlete on YouTube mm. and subscribe to my Vegan Athlete YouTube channel. But also you can follow me on Instagram at jakemacetaichi, like you would do Tai Chi for meditation. Yeah, T-A-I-C-H-I, Jake Mace Tai Chi. Yeah, perfect. Yep. Perfect, perfect. And then for those of you living in the Phoenix metropolitan area, our fruit tree program launches with a great live in-person event. I'm hoping to have about 500 people come and join us at that event. It's on September 2nd from 8.30 to 12.30. Jake will be talking. Uh, I'm going to be talking. We're, we've got somebody coming in. Uh, uh, Raphael, she's coming in to talk about how to create a food forest in your yard and thinking like a, you know, thinking like a food forest. So um, any, any last single thoughts before we sign off, Jake? You know, see if you guys can, uh, this next week, for the next seven days, can you eat at least one meal out of your garden, at least one meal per day, every day for the next week out of your garden, and then go on my Urban Gardening in Arizona Facebook group and share a picture or a video of what you're eating out of your garden with the group. There's 30,000 members there now. Is that all? Yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's going, it's climbing every day too. Wow. Way cool, way cool. So we do these things once a month. Jake and I get online and answer your questions. So we're about, I think, I, I, I'm guessing that it's about the 16th of September for the next one. I also do a live seed saving chat with Bill McDorman uh, about the fourth week of every month. So you can check that out. If you go to urbanfarm.org and sign up for our newsletter on the front page, you get all this information. So thank you all very much for joining us this evening. And thank you, Jake, for continuing to play. I love doing these with you and working with you, Jake. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, thanks, Greg. So you guys don't know, Greg is the one that sets all this up. I just get to plug in and start talking. So Greg yeah. does all the interface and sets it up. So thank you to Greg. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, as I always like to say, farm out, and I will catch you all on the flip side. Thanks for being here. Healthy food is something everybody wants. Delicious and nutritious and right outside your own door is even better. Just text GARDEN to 44222 or visit IWANTTOGARDEN.COM and you will receive our free webinar about the seven key factors you need to know to grow your own food. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen three days a week for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.